Hi, I'm Mike Vardy, and I'm about to have a productive conversation with David Allen. Welcome to a productive conversation. I'm Mike Vardy, and this time around, we're visiting the vault again, and it's a very timely visit, not because the conversation with David Allen is a vault slash archived episode from March 2015, but as this episode airs or is released, I will be in Lisbon at the Running Remote event, the conference, taking the stage and having a fireside chat slash productive conversation with the one and only David Allen. So I thought it was fitting to revisit this conversation from just over eight years ago, which to me is, it's stunning that this podcast in all of its forms, first as the Productivity is Podcast, then as a productive conversation, it's been around for that long. And actually it was all along, been around longer than that. But to go back that far, it's interesting to see how the landscape of getting things done and where David is compared to where he is now. And I'll probably release something in the not too distant future that talks about, you know, what happened at the running remote event. You can follow me on social media and all that stuff. Those links are widely available and you'll be able to follow what's going on there. But I wanted to revisit this conversation today. So that's what we're delivering as our vault episode for this month. So here we go. Here is from March 2015, my conversation with David Allen and a productive one at that. Enjoy. David, thanks so much for joining me. Mike, a delight as always. Um, so we had a chance to, to connect last year at South by Southwest. So it, basically a year ago, um, which was great. Uh, we didn't get to see each other speak because we both spoke at the same time. Uh, yours was a conversation with David Allen, which was, but incidentally, everyone, that's not him talking to himself. There was another, there was another well, David Allen. It, it was sort of. I, I, that's kind of what I do. But, yeah. <laughs> um, but I want to talk a bit about not just the new book, uh, because a lot of the listeners out there, know, you know, they, they're either GDD uh, followers um, or they've read the book. Uh, I want to get a little bit deeper into some of the other stuff that that follows around, uh, you know, stress free, stress free productivity, because that's I think the key is the stress free part. A lot of people, especially now, um, in ter- there's a feeling of you know we have to be more productive, and there's so much more stress surrounding it because of all the information that comes our way and all the different ways that information can come our way. And before we dive into some of the how people can com- combat that a bit with GTD as well as what you've got in the new book, I want to kind of talk to you about the 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 problem that is perceived out there when it comes to that uh, new te- fangled technology we're seeing more and more of that people are dealing with email. Now, email isn't that new, but what we're what I'm seeing, and, and I don't know if you see this as well, is is that people just keep keep getting stuck in that space. In you know, they can't get away from email. I've had one one client I talked to today who says, you know, I have to check I, email cannot be off for me. I must check it all the time, and then I can't get my other stuff done. I mean, I don't know if you. I, I would imagine that you've got some kind of strategy that you use to either deal with email so that it doesn't become this this you know kind of bastion of stress. What, what do you do and what do you, what do you kind of tell people when it comes to dealing with email in terms of either using it as a task management tool or, or just trying to deal with it as a consistent thing that's, that's kind of pulling at them? Well, don't shoot the medium. Mm. You know, I've, been, I've been on email since, since most people listening to this were born. Right. You know, I, got, I got 1983, easy link, you know, with a Radio Shack Model 100 I travel with, with alligator plugs to plug it into the wall. With my, I don't know, four point nothing modem to try to connect in with that. So I've been around that game a long time, and and wow, we wouldn't even have this conversation if there weren't for email. So you know, obviously that's a that's a kind of a duh, don't shoot the medium. The, the issues, the issues, in, in a way, it's good news for me because all, all of the plethora of email and constant on, and you know, constant accessibility uh, about that is forcing the issues about, you know, what people are really about, what they're doing, what's meaningful, what's not. Uh, there's two spins I have on this right now, and I, I have to do a, a, a very important sidebar on this, Mike. A book is, I didn't write, so this is not a paid political announcement. Brand new book out called Brain Chains. Two words, brain chains, as in the chains around your brain. By a guy named Theo Compernale, C-O-M-P-E-R-N-O-L-L-E, who lives in Brussels right now. But it is a compilation of lots of new and the last decade of research in neuroscience about how all of that always-on stuff 
is absolutely pretend that that's improving anybody's productivity in terms of the new generation, the digital generation. Do they have different brains? No, they don't. It took a million years to develop what we got. They're not going to change it in 10 years, believe me. And it, its limitation is now being overwhelmed by what people are trying to put in their brains and trying to keep in there. And a lot of new data about that. In other words, your brain actually cannot multitask. And when you try to do that, your switching costs are, are, are absurdly uh, uh, detrimental. So th there's a lot of data about that right now. The other data that also it has to do with email is how addictive it is. You know, literally, addiction as in dopamine hits that happen when you get an email ping or think you do. <laughs> Fascinating data that even just thinking what might be landing in your smartphone or your email actually gives you a dopamine rush. And the dopamine rush, believe it or not, actually you get it even if 99% of your email is crap. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You still get it. It's just the 1%. It's like the, actually the more random the positive reinforcement, the deeper the addiction. Well, so there's a, there's a lot of data about that right now, which says, yeah, there's a certain portion of the fact that this always on dopamine rush producing dinging is uh, undermining. And it's not you need to give that up. It's just, well, wait a minute, just be aware that that's happening or is likely to happen. And then what are you not doing because of that? What are you avoiding because of that? So back around to the initial question you asked, the other spin on this is that <clears> – <throat> um, and by the way, the guy who wrote that, Theo and I, are, 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 are combining our resources to do a workshop in Amsterdam in the fall together. Because the necessity for GTD to be able to chunk, essentially, the information that is potentially meaningful to you, so it's not constantly nagging at your brain, is absolutely survival stuff these days. You've got to do that. And if you're not, you're living in emergency scan mode, which is then that constant trying to multitask, which your brain can't actually do, which is just compounding all the stress about what's going on there. And, and, and back to the neuroscience, you know, the, um, uh, Tierney and Baumeister in their book, Willpower, which was a great book that, that began to, uh, you know, uh, aggregate some of this uh, research about the brain. They're the guys who popularized the idea of decision fatigue. So the, ref the, the reflective part of your brain, which comes out of the forebrain, the executive function, is one that actually gets tired. Every decision you make draws down its horsepower. Mm -hmm. And, and it, there, you have a limit to the number of things. So you don't want to be trying to force yourself to make decisions at the end of a long decision-making day. You, you, you got no juice. Yeah. Right? You will then revert to your reflexive brain which is the limbic brain, the survival brain, and it basically is just going to be whatever's present, latest and loudest, you know, survive, eat or, eat or be eaten, you know, uh, the, kind of the part of the brain that evolved to do that. And that's not a very trustworthy part of your brain. So the, all that point is, is that if you still leave a bunch of stuff that I still haven't decided what it means or where it goes and I have to re-decide what to do about it every time I open my email app, that you've just added huge amounts of, of, of drain on your cognitive horsepower. Mm -hmm. so, so again, we're now getting scientific data that says you better chunk these things into, into the categories that they mean. And again, most people are lit, you know, back to actually your initial question, most people don't zero out their backlog of inputs, including email, every 24 to 40 hours like I do. If you do that, you don't need to be in your email all day. Sometimes I'm there all day because why not? And I'm sitting here, I'm hanging out, and, and it's a great conversation. And I got an open door office, you know. <laughs> it's, yep. just, it's just digital, not, not physical. But there are times when that's fine. It's exactly what I want to do. You know, and nothing, and nothing inherently wrong with that. You know, a lot of that depends on what else I'm trying to do. Am I doing that to avoid something I ought to be doing? Well, that's another issue. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. I'm doing that because I just want to be spontaneous and open and see what's coming in, you know, in my world, it's much, I'm much freer to do that the more my backlog is at zero. If my backlog is at 2,000 still unprocessed things that are dinging at me, yelling at me, whispering at me or whatever, call, hey, decide about me, do something about me, and there may be something potentially significant in there, then anything that's new input feels bad. It feels like an interruption and adds to stress as opposed to, wow, hmm, new opportunity to engage with my world. I want to touch base on context because I know when I try to explain context to people, I don't know if you mean, it's just one of those things where people are so linear minded when they work by project. And so they're very, you know, I know if I go through step A, step B, step C through this project, I'll get it to done, but it takes a lot. I mean, they, they get to across to a point where they're stuck on something and they can't move it forward. And so you try to say, okay, well, what if you worked by context? And they're like, well, what, explain it to me. And you, what is the way that you find that 
resonates with not just the the people who are GTDers that really okay yes this is what a context is but for those who are who have never even thought about working by context even though they probably have worked by context how do you kind of you know, crack that nut because it's one of those things where I think people are so used to working in a linear fashion that context may not seem to be as as linear as it could be does that make sense. It does. However, Mike, you might want to reframe context because they're just talking about context called context by project or context by linear sequence. Mm. They're all context. Yeah. No, it's and true. It's you're going to hear you're, – you're, you're, this is new field in all of technology that's going on. It's context-based stuff. But context, context could be how you feel. Context could be where I am physically. It could be – context could be I, – I, I have an action list called creative writing, which is – the same context as at computer, but I needed to spin that out of my at computer stuff because a lot of my at computer stuff is stuff I can handle at my desk sitting, sitting upright, you know, just managing the business of the day kind of things that require that. And then I need to, I need to be, I need to sit down. I need to lay back a little bit and put my computer in my lap as opposed to on my desk in order to do the creative writing stuff. So I found like right now I have two very different kind of contexts. And it's very useful to see my work in those things. If I blend those together, then in either place, I feel overwhelmed <laughs> because mm-hmm. I don't feel capable of doing creative thinking while I'm sitting at my desk, but I've got a bunch of creative th- thinking staring at me. But if I'm just sitting back, you know, then I-, I see all this other work to do and I can't really focus myself on the creative context I need to be in. I need to be in a reflective mode. I need to be able to have, you know, a, a little bit of a time base, you know, a time um, window here to be able to then get into the flow of some thinking and some creative writing. So if you, you know, that's, if you, un, if, if you think about that, that, that was, that was again down in the weeds, but there is some subtlety here in terms of those distinctions and there's absolutely nothing wrong with either way. It's mm-hmm. called, Hey, well, pick out your context. You want to organize all your actions by projects? Go right ahead. Absolutely. So, you know, I think people took, you know, what I wrote in, in Getting Things Done and, and a lot of the writing that say, well, most people have found when I'm out with a phone, I'd rather see all my phone calls on a list as opposed to have to go find them all in project lists. It's like, yeah, duh. You know, I'm out for errands. You know, I don't want to have to find my errands organized by the project that Aaron is about. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm out in my car. I'm walking around. I'm downtown. You know, show me my errands. So it's a little hard to refute the the practical value of having those kind of reminders and triggers organized by where you need them and where you could actually do the action. But that can get pretty subtle. There's no there's no right or wrong about that. It's just called well you decide. You, you know if if you are a total macro freak in Excel and you decide you want to list all these things and put all the different potential tags you might want to. This is a phone call, but it's also with low energy and it also only takes four minutes. It's also about my family, and you know, I, and it also gives me this emotional payoff if I actually finish this thing. Sure, make a column for each one. <laughs> that'll that'll last about two hours while the rain is raining on a, a on a Saturday, and your inner geek has shown up and thought that's really cool. But as soon as the fire hose of of Monday hit you in the face, you know, you're not going to do it. You're not going to even start. Now uh, let's dive into the book a little bit before I want to talk about, um, you know, where you're at now, but the, the, what's, what's different in the book this time around for those, I mean, it's been what, uh, almost a dozen years. We're talking, how many years has it been? You know, since I actually started, I started writing it in 98, 99. So Ooh. we're talking, you know, when, when's that? So, you know, 15 years, yeah, something like that. Plus um, what's different is, I, I literally transcribed the whole text and retranscribed it based upon how I would say it now. And so essentially I rewrote the whole book, though if you read it again, you say, well, that's the same paragraph, that's the same paragraph. Yeah, those I said, that's exactly the way I'd say it now. So I have to say, you know, pardon my, you know, if, if, you know, if there's an ego boost here, I just have to take it. It's called Wow, a lot of that was really good. I read it over. <laughs> I, I, I frankly had never reread the whole book start to finish since I wrote it. So the, <laughs> it gave me the opportunity to go, well, that's a great way to say that. Oh, well, you know, oh, oh, yeah, I wrote that. Oh, well, that's really good. But then there was a good bit of language that um, from more maturity of my awareness of this methodology and the sublimity of its application and, and its implications that I, I – I refined a lot of my words in the book to make it more evergreen, 
more like, hey, in 2190, when we land on Jupiter, they can still read this book and go, oh, God, we need an in-basket and we need to make next action decisions. So the methodology didn't change. Nothing about that. It right. was more about the methodology in the world we're living in now with a more universal sort of vocabulary and also perhaps a more sophisticated vocabulary. For instance, I made some very subtle changes over the last few years in thinking about, for instance, the five steps to how do you get control of your kitchen or your company. You know, you need to, in the book, it, in the first edition, it says collect, process, organize, review, do, which was basically a very tactical manual about I need to collect the stuff that's out of place. I need to process what it means. I need to organize it. I need to then step back and review it, and then I need to engage in some way. I just changed the vocabulary to instead of collect, it's capture. Instead of process, it's clarify. Organize stayed the same. Instead of review, it's reflect. And instead of do, it's engage. Mm. Because if you think of those four words I changed, uh, collect, change to capture. Because really, if you're trying to get a truly clear head to create space, psychologically or, or otherwise, you really need to capture all the potential things, not just the obvious things that are out of control or, or that have your attention, but anything else that might should have your attention in that process. So capture is a more broad or a deeper or more subtle perhaps a warmer or more elegant way to say, say more, more holistic even to a certain exactly. extent. Yeah, exactly. Same thing was true with, with process to clarify because clarify just means I need to decide exactly what this means as opposed to there's some process, some mechanical thing I need, need to run this through. Now you can still interchange the words, which I do. So mm. you, they're still interchangeable. They, they didn't change what the behavior is that you do when you do it, but more a way to describe it and express it that perhaps indicates it a, a deeper, more subtle level of how powerful this is. And, and you know what? Actually, what I think those words do is they also make it a little bit easier for people to say, well, I use GTD at work, but then all of a sudden I get home and I just lose it because I've just I, I've got that one brain for work and one brain for home, which some exactly. people do. This allows it to kind of cross, cross over between and transcend both because it should. I mean, it's, it's a lifestyle, right? <laughs> so, well, that's, and that, Mike, is, is a lot of what I put in the book. As a matter of fact, a chapter I added at the very end is the GTD path of mastery, which is a lifelong lifestyle process. And that's something that we've really come to acknowledge. I knew it intuitively even when I wrote the book, the first edition. But the first edition was really just trying to put a message out there more as a tactical manual for the professional world that was starting to get overwhelmed with all kinds of things. And as as a new spin on the, what was the old sort of time management stuff. But since then, you know, a lot of the subtlety has emerged in terms of the, the, the what you just expressed, which is, wow, this is about my whole life. You know, this is not just what I do at work, but I need to decide next actions on what I do with this, with my kids, you know, college applications. I need to decide next actions on mom's elder care right now. I need to, I need to apply this thought process to my whole life. Like, no kidding. Well, I've known that from the beginning, but the new book, uh, the new edition of it basically has changed a bit of my examples and, you know, and the vocabulary to, be ex- to, to make it much easier and more elegant and warmer, I guess, for people to engage in a- as a lifestyle process. I mean, how good can you get at cooking or parenting or learning mm-hmm. Italian or doing the tango or playing the flute? There's no end. There's no end to that. And there's just in that same way, there's no end to how good you can get at managing the flow of life's work, which is what GTD is about. Well, you're in a different place now too. When you wrote the first book, I mean, you're 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 in, you're in Europe now. <laughs> you weren't in Europe when yeah. you were, but I mean, yeah. it changes. And, 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 and I'm 69. You know, that yeah. also makes <laughs> it changes the perspective of you know the lens that you're looking at it through. And I wanted to ask you a couple more questions before we wrap up. Number one, you are now in Europe, and what is there? Do you see any cultural like differences in, in terms of how either whether GTD is is kind of adopted or how it's or it's applied versus like say the north american style of of you know engagement versus what you're seeing maybe overseas or is that something you haven't really explored yet uh you know well, well i'm touching into it all over the world we're now franchising around the world our our training programs so i'm getting to see it and uh, there's i've known from the beginning there was no cultural bias to this mm. You know, I, it, it, it was a question until I went to Japan way out in the far reaches in a place that should have already had this already figured out in terms of the Zen, you know, side of it. And they're all going, oh, we're overwhelmed. We need this too. And I went, okay, well, you know, that was enough of a validation for me that this, there's nobody doesn't need this who's trying to manage more than they can, you know, has more stuff to do than they have time to deal with. 
and still has, you know, all of these levels of commitments and opportunities in their lives they're trying to manage. So there's no distinction to that. It's really more, there's more, there's a bigger distinction between you and your next door neighbor and you and your cousin, Mike, than between you and about, you know, a, a million people around the world that are GTDers. Gotcha. So it's, it's mainly just how, is it even, it's not even really how it's presented, it's not even nuances. It's just the fact that you're just being there and helping them with this stuff, right? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, our, we made a choice a while ago. Go, let's go where the world wants this to go, you know? And, you know, there was a good, uh, Catherine and I decided to move to Europe. It was more of a, as much of a sort of lifestyle adventure, shift gears, time for a new perspective, you know, shake ourselves up and, and get a new window on the world. Uh, and we had fallen in love with Amsterdam, so why not? And I had the freedom to be able to do that business-wise, to you know, to be able to sort of shift gears. But there was also a good business reason to be here. They were getting a good bit of traction with GTD. You can imagine GTD as a just generally culturally sure. The northern European countries are probably going to take to it just because of their system orientation and design orientation. You know, Scandinavia, Germany, UK, Ireland, etc. So yeah, um, yeah. It, it's it's taking off there. It, it, but it's still, you know, I'm, we've, I'm, I, I, I'm doing, you know, keynotes in St. Petersburg, Russia, and in Dubai, and in Kuwait, and in, and in Italy, and you know, and Nashville, Tennessee. So it's it's all the same thing. We're, we're when you find the same level of professionals out there. I mean, it really is a global world. It's kind of fascinating to see how much how how similar this next generation of professionals really is. And it's much smaller. It's a much smaller world. Thanks, yeah. to, thanks to things yeah. like the, like the things, the very things that can overwhelm people are, is, are what make it much much smaller. Uh, final- even, even even transcending the differences between you know Canadians and the, and Americans. I mean, and the U.S. You know, wow. Yeah. Because we don't say you know you you betcha yeah. <laughs> or a or uh, a, right. oh, 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 oh. I haven't dropped that yet. Uh, <laughs> um, one of the things that that I think some people struggle with this is kind of the last question we'll ask is that whole is the horizons of focus. I think a lot of people kind of get stuck in the I'm going to make my list for today, and the review is obviously a key component of making sure that you're moving closer and closer to what you want to do. But what what do you say to people who are struggling with the the they just say, hey, I can't get past the, the lists, the days list. I can't get to the next horizons or whatever. They're just stuck in that phase. What? How do you help people get either break through that? Uh, is it just through consistent practice, or how do you how do you can how do you help them manifest to that next le- or to see beyond just the what's in front of them that specific day? Yeah, well, it's nice to have some frameworks and some coaching and some motivation about that. Called, hey, when's the last time you lifted up your horizons and took a look? You know, Catherine and I have to shake ourselves every end of the year and sit down and say, okay, hey, what would we like to have on our list next year that we accomplish this year? You know, and that won't happen by itself. You actually have to sit down and put a little cognitive, you know, horsepower to focus on those kinds of things. I, you know, I don't think you need to take those too seriously. But at the same time, they don't necessarily happen by themselves. And all those levels, we, we actually are in all those levels, I think. So it's like how much more conscious do you need to be about them? Mm. But there's, I think, you know, a lot of people take them, in a sense, uh, not sincerely enough and too seriously. <laughs> right. So, you know, the, the, I, I think there's that sort of paradoxical combination where you have to realize how powerful imagery is. And what you put your focus on is where you're going to start leading your life and you're going to start to put a lot of things in motion, you know, wherever you're putting your creative focus. And you can't help it if you're conscious, putting your creative, whatever you're looking at. So... Uh, I couldn't get it any simpler than the six horizons of focus that that was as simple as I could get the different sig- significantly different levels that people have commitments on themselves. Why am I on the planet? What's my vision of success? If I fulfill that, you know, wonderfully, what do I need to accomplish in the next short period of time that will get me there? What are the things I need to maintain at some level of standard so I have a healthy body and enterprise? And then what are the projects I've got and then what are the actions I have to do about all those? I, I just couldn't get it any simpler than that. All of those are relevant. Now, how conscious do you need to be about all those? As conscious as you need to be to basically be present. <laughs> so, mm. you know, hey, is it time to have a conversation with your boss about your job description? Is it time to have a conversation with your family about where you want to be five years from now in your lifestyle and what's going on? Is it time to have a conversation with yourself and any spiritual advisors or life coach advisors about what your purpose on the planet is and where you really want to be lifestyle and career wise? You know, so... All of those are great conversations. You don't have to have them all all the time, but you need to be aware that maybe that's the level or horizon I need to have a conversation about. 
One of the things I love about GTD is, is that it can really be as powerful as you need it to be, but as simple as you want it to be. It's just yeah. as, as soon as people start to really it, – it, it's the – it's the notion, and I'm, and I, I'm hoping people pick up the, the new edition because, like you said, it's going to add some more evergreen components to it. Uh, the Palm Pilot will probably be removed from the equation, I would imagine. It is. <laughs> it's, it's actually, almost every specific re, uh, uh, reference to software has been removed because those will be out of date in a week. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it, but, the, but the behavior about how do I need to assess any tool that I'm using, software, paper, pen, chalkboard, whatever, that, that, that really needs to be focused on. Yeah, the approach is far more important than the app. Mm-hmm. So, uh, David, thanks again for taking the time to, to talk to me today and, and uh, share, share some of this with, uh, with my listeners. Uh, the book is uh, called Getting Things Done, The Art of Stress-Free Productivity. Is it called Second Edition, I guess, at this point? It says a brand new edition for 2015 on the front cover. There so. you go. And beyond. 2015 and beyond, of course. Yeah, after 2015, <laughs> they'll take that off. But at least for now, you know, that, that'll, that'll be a sales tool they, they're using. So. And it'll be available in all fine bookstores as well as on Amazon. So and it's actually available today. It's available pre-order as we record this. But today's the, the day it goes comes out and hits the market. And, and uh, I, I couldn't be happier uh, to to pick it up and, and, and give it another read through because uh, I've read GTD quite a, a number of times <laughs> and every time I've read it, I got something different out of it because it's just that type of book where you, I found that you're ready for the next thing to really resonate with you as you read it. Um, and every time I read it, I get something different out of it. So David, thanks again for, for taking the time and thanks again for creating such a seminal piece of work. Thanks, Mike, and thanks for all your support. And you know, best wishes to you and all, all your listeners there. Again, the fact that I can go back and trace my conversations with David Allen over the years is phenomenal, and this was an example of one such conversation. Of course, again, I'm recording this in advance, so I'm sure the conversation that David and I had on the stage in Lisbon was another great one. And I hope you'll check that out which I will share on social. Of course, all the links that we talked about, any links that are re- relevant to what we're doing right now will be in the show notes, which you can find at productivityist.com slash podcast or seven two. And you can also see those show notes on the podcast app you're using right now, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, what have you. And while you're there, subscribe to the podcast because then you can find episodes, gems, jewels that are in the vault like this one quickly and easily. Plus, you won't miss a single episode of What's to Come. So again, subscribe to the podcast. It's one of the ways you can support the show. Another way is to visit our sponsors, including the ones that you heard on this episode during our conversation. All you need to do for that is go to productivityist.com slash podcast sponsors, check out any or all of the sponsors, and then let them know that we sent you. That's it for this episode. We're back with a fresh episode shiny and new next week. But until next time, I'm Mike Vardy, the host of A Productive Conversation, reminding you to stop doing productive and start being productive. See you later.